I travel a lot between China and Europe. I jump into a plane in the evening and next morning I arrive and I can work right away. But should I think more about the merits of moving at a slower pace? Thank you for joining us here on Asia Talk in Beijing's Art District 798. Today we are going to talk about rediscovering how to move at a slower pace. What does the speed of globalization do to us and are we moving fast enough to keep up? One of Germany's top China managers recently embarked on a journey to see what it means to take your time. He has just driven all the way from Erlangen in Germany to Beijing in a 49 Volkswagen Beetle. During his trip, with no doubt included many oil changes, he had a lot of time to think about Asia and the West and how both sides are dealing with globalization. Welcome, Dr. Richard Hausmann. Pleasure to meet you. Mr. Hausmann, of course, uh, you're not driving a Beetle as a real profession. You have uh, uh, other profession you're working on. You're a physicist having studied in Regensburg and New York. And later you started the career with Siemens and then 2005 you moved to China and since then you are president of Siemens in China. Um, but you also have the largest Beetle collection in China, in, in, uh, in China as well, because some of the Beetles were there for a moment. But normally your Beetle collection with five Beetles are in Erlangen, and so it's at least the biggest collection in Erlangen. You have recently traveled from Germany to Beijing over four weeks, covering 11,000 kilometers in a Beetle with 24.5 horsepower. Mr. Hausmann, what did you discover during this very slow drive? Well, yeah, what we discovered. First of all, of course, we, we went basically from Germany to China, but uh, the longest time we stayed in Russia. So we discovered really Russia, and also we not only discovered it, but also we started to love Russia. And the original idea was actually to say, OK, I'm flying so many times between China and Germany, and it's 11,000 kilometer distance and I don't have a feeling for it. So what I wanted to really get is by driving the cars to China is a feeling for this distance. What, what are you curious about? Well, I wanted to see the cities which I am flying over. I wanted to see the Lake Baikal, for example, which I always see lying down beautifully uh, in 10, 000, from 10,000 meter height. So it was actually the landscapes, the people, the cities I wanted to really inhale. You traveled in a big group. You were about 14 people, two doctors, um, repairmen, other people, and you were five or six beetles uh, and two cars helping you. So uh, what happened on this trip? So we were exactly five beetles. Mm -hmm. uh, the oldest one was from 1949, the youngest one was from 1956. And we had two service cars which Volkswagen actually sent us, sent with us onto the tour. Uh, what happened to us? Oh, many, many things. I mean, we had, uh, we had uh, watching. We had to watch a sandstorm in in the Gobi Desert. We had, we had beautiful uh, experiences when meeting with Volkswagen friends and Beetle friends in Kazan and Moscow and Vilnius. So we had so many smiles on the road. And we had also some repairs, of course. And the slowest uh, part of the trip was the border crossing to Russia and from Russia to Mongolia. What happened there? Well, actually, it is yeah. It was the border crossing from uh, uh, Latvia to to Russia, and uh, actually there, first of all, 
Um, it took just a lot of time uh, for the examination, so we had to wait as a team for around about 24 hours. So we slept in a Volkswagen Beetle, which was an interesting experience in itself. Did they have seats, those kind of cars? No, no. You know, have to know, a Volkswagen Beetle of that age has exactly what's needed, but not more. So you slept sitting? Uh, we tried to sleep sitting, yeah. But every one hour we had to move 50 meters forward anyway, so uh, that was okay. That was a good experience. But then, actually, that was only part of it. The next problem was actually our service car with all the spare parts, with two res uh, reserve engines, etc. got stuck in customs. And it took us quite some time, actually two days, to get this car off the customs again. And you had some quite heavy repairing to do and some spare parts to fly in. What happened? Well, as usually, you take a lot of spare parts with you, but those spare parts which you take with you, you don't need. Uh, and we, of course, needed one other piece which we didn't have with us. It was the torsion bar, so the spring, basically, for the rear axle on the left side. And it broke in my car. It was just actually interesting enough on the way in Irkutsk to the garage where we wanted to have some oil service so for the car. So you were quite happy about so there was this, huh? luck in bed luck, yeah. Um, but this spare part we didn't have with us. So there was actually lots of, of course, discussions, what should we do? And we actually tried to uh, do in parallel three ways of solving the problem. One was let's take the good part and let's copy the part by a local company as it is, but it would have taken us a few more days. Uh, second solution was take the part, get the part from Volkswagen in Wolfsburg and they had a part there and they sent off the part but somehow it got stuck in Moscow. And the third solution which finally worked was actually that a friend of mine who originally wanted to join us on a tour and had all the visas which were necessary, uh, I called him up and said, okay, you can help us now. Uh, and bring us the spare parts to Irkutsk and actually it was really uh, very, very kind of fortunate that he, within a day, he jumped on the plane from Nuremberg to Paris to Moscow to Irkutsk and one day later we had the spare parts. So this was kind of a top manager's approach to try three solutions that one's gonna we had various situations, uh, you're right, we had various situations where there was some management uh, talent necessary to uh, get this thing going. <laughs> did, did you need the doctors? Uh, yeah, we needed for small things. Uh, uh, first of all, I kind of uh, torqued my, my ankle a little bit uh, uh, at the Mongolian border. It's healing already. And another accident was just in the Gobi Desert. Uh, one of the team members tried to cut some bread and he he stuck his uh, Swiss army knife into the hand and actually it's so deep that it had to kind of be sued. Uh, so that was really? interesting. But uh, it was not during driving, it was no. all uh, when you were tired from yeah. driving. We had yeah. no accidents, nothing like that. Yeah. It was really luck. Mm. You had a lot of time to think about, uh, uh, about speed, about slower pace, about uh, uh, how it is to go fast and not so fast. What came to your mind on all mm. this? Hours and hours you were riding your car. First of all, I have to say it never get boring. got boring. Uh, first of all, everything was changing, the landscape, the skies, the clouds, the people were changing and it was always interesting. But uh, it was really true that after one or two weeks, the really relaxing time started. You get, get some distance from the business. Uh, you didn't really jump on every email you got on the BlackBerry right away. So it was getting a little more relaxed. So that was an interesting experience for me, never having such a long continuous vacation, that really the relaxing aspect of a vacation starts only after two weeks. Did you like it? Uh, I liked it very much. You want to repeat it? Uh, maybe not on that exercise, but I have to say that if we then, if, I, if we do, I'll do uh, some vacation with the family later on, I will definitely remember that it might be necessary to stay longer than just one or one and a half week. I think the, the real interesting thing was meeting with a lot of people. Uh, I, for example, we, had, uh, we were invited uh, by, by, by a Mongolian family just in the midst of the Gobi Desert to have some soup together uh, in the yurt. Uh, so it, it was just, I mean, unbelievable how friendly a lot of people have been on the way. There was so much horning and filming and taking pictures of, of us when they passed us in Russia. So it was, it was just, I mean, getting into a culture which usually you fly over. 
you know, which is Russia and also Mongolia. It's usually you don't go there so many times. And you met quite a few Beatles clubs. Yeah, we met a few Beatles clubs. We had organized that. I had organized that beforehand already by internet and, and emails. Of course, it got to, was known already on the, in the in the sort of say Beatles society that there is this crazy guys from Germany <laughs> trying to drive to China. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so we, 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 we had some interactions, for example, in Kazan, uh, in Moscow and in Vilnius. Uh, in Vilnius, we have been invited to the marketplace, the market square in the center of the city. Uh, there was then a, a, a couple coming, a bride and, and, and her, her husband, and jumping into the, the cabriolet for picture taking. It was just lots of fun, lots of fun. Can I imagine? And did they help you to repair your cars? Uh, actually, they were always uh, on the road. We had uh, k kind of the support by the Volkswagen dealerships. That was very helpful. We did the work ourselves, but we used the elevators and those kind of the lifts for, for the cars. Yeah. And you had your own block during the trip, so everybody could uh, follow what you were doing. And on, the, on August 19th, there's uh, a block entry that only says horror trip previous day. What happened on the 18th? Uh, I think there was a trip from Krasnoyarsk to Tulun. It was only quote unquote 600, a little bit more than 600 kilometers. Normally you, would, uh, you did more? Uh, no, normally we, that was a quite a long stretch. Nevertheless, we usually would have done it in say 10 hours. But this time we need 17 hours for this trip. What was the problem? Uh, the problem was actually the fact that the road was under construction on that strip. So they, Russia is building a nice little, nice highway through, but it was not finished yet. And therefore we had to kind of uh, sur go around a lot of uh, places and it was no paved, paved highway. It was a lot of mud holes. There were a lot of trucks on the road and it got dark and da, da, da. so it was a real real stretch. <laughs> it was very stressful for you as well as a driver. Yeah, it was absolutely stressful for me as a driver. What was the most stressful thing driving this car all day? The seats? No, the seats actually are quite comfortable. I have still the original seats in. Some of my colleagues no, put new others ones, in. Huh? No, no, they are all still okay. Uh, honestly speaking, what, what it was for me as the owner of the, of the Beetle pretty stressful to be the co-driver on bad roads mm -hmm. because then the shaking you and, and the, that your car is going to break exactly and therefore i usually took uh, took the driver's position when it got difficult is it the same with your wife <laughs> uh, no comment <laughs> <laughs> but there was no female driver there, there was a boys group basically uh, it was a boys group and it was good it was a very heterogeneous team age 18 to uh, 63 so father and son and retired uh, uh, people and active people managers uh, repair expert uh, two doctors which were very helpful so it was a very interesting team uh, and was a good team, team dynamics inside as well. Perfect so you traveled from a country which is probably a bit slower already to a country China which is one of the fastest growing countries in the world. What are the differences between these two countries apart from this? Well, I mean, let's start with the similarities maybe first. And the similarity was really that uh, you had we had very good highways in Germany, and we had right on the border of China very good highways in China as well. In between, very mixed experiences. <laughs> uh, so interesting enough, the are infrastructure. The Chinese, are the Chinese highways as good as the Germans? Uh, I would say so. I would say the same. I yes. would say so. Uh, and it started right away on the border in the Mongolia, a whole stretch through uh, from from the border towards uh, the south. Very nice uh, highway. So that was the, the same thing. Of course, I mean there are a lot of differences, and uh, especially when you live as as I do for five years now in China, you see a lot of differences between the two cultures, especially when looking back to Germany. What are the differences? Well, I mean, uh, one thing which is certainly uh, uh, what you see is from the, from the positive side is that uh, you value a lot of things which you take as a given when you live in Germany, uh, you value them more. For example, uh, the organization of, uh, for example, larger project, the structure which we put into, uh, which you put into some things, the, maybe you call it also engineering excellence, something like that. This is something which, which, which you value even more the more you are outside Germany. At the same point, you sometimes uh, see uh, maybe too much, maybe negative thinking uh, or concerns in in the society in Germany. Things were creating say, problems. Creating problems 
itself, you know, and, and, and where you say, oh, no, 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 like only Germans can really talk about that even, yeah. <laughs> so it's both ways. Does this get more and more the longer you're in China that you have, that you get um, impatient towards those kind of problem creating well, groups? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I get impatient, but the, the point is actually that uh, at some point uh, uh, you, have, you have different phases. Uh, I mean, I'm living five years here now. I had uh, the kind of oh, great phase and then there is, and maybe you have a similar experience and you get into a phase where you think, oh God, uh, yes. how can I stand this? It's too fast maybe and it's too uh, superficial sometimes. And then it's starting to be fun again. And then it's starting to be fun again, yeah. So uh, there are different phases and I think a similar thing is in Germany, when you look back to Germany, uh, uh, sometimes uh, I feel maybe it is getting stronger the appreciation of the good things over the time, the longer you're out. But of course the question is then, going back, how do you integrate again into this kind of surrounding? Can you give an example of a product where the Chinese with those kind of approach are faster? Are hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the la last few, few months or maybe the last two years we are discussing and thinking a lot about the, the electric car. The electric cars is certainly one thing where, where I feel that uh, the Chinese companies are extremely fast in, in a kind of try and error approach, getting fast into a maybe not 100% ideal solution, but trying it out, which I think in this business and this market, it, it, it will help a lot to iterate it, getting better and better faster. What are they making difference? Um, well, I mean, they basically don't try to make the 100% solution right away, but they make maybe the 90 95% solution. Whereas uh, typically in the German uh, engineering approach, you try to think it through completely uh, or as, mus as much as, as possible, and then maybe it takes too much time to get to the first solution. Whereas others then have already extra iteration more. So I think uh, there, we, we in this area, we as a German industry probably need to move faster. So in this area we can learn from China? Uh, we should have at least be aware of the fact that there is a lot of activity going on here. And we have to speed up because they set up. the speed. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And there's a big market here. And in which ways China could learn from us? I think there are probably as, more things. I think as, as, as long as it comes to a systematic uh, uh, thinking, system thinking, uh, s complexity in systems, I think the approach, which of course is more the intellectual, the thinker approach, is, 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 is the better one, there's no question. Because at some point one, one needs to understand a complex system in, in full uh, to improve on it. You know? But that is a long way to go, probably. Well, yeah, on both sides. Are these two cultures merging? Are they getting closer? Are the differences uh, becoming less important? I, w I would say that, that China uh, as a culture is certainly more internationalizing anyway. I wouldn't say it's more getting German, but it's getting more international. So I've, I've, I appreciate very much that, for example, English la language capabilities are increasing significantly by returnees, but also by the school system here. Uh, so I would say it's maybe not the German and Chinese uh, coming together, but Chinese is moving more towards an international culture. So it will be one big culture at the no, end? Hopefully not. I think uh, the <laughs> differences I think are, are, are the, the, the salt in the soup uh, and, and I, would, I, would, I would not like to see a world where everything is one sort of say grey mass. What was the biggest surprise in these five years for you when you came to China? And the biggest surprise, I think, is definitely the speed of development. I think nobody in Germany, uh, even when you visit China, um, say, uh, twice or three times a year, uh, really feel this pace. Um, the pace is even faster than this four or five months. It's, it's sometimes you are away for a month for a particular spot and then there's a new building up there. Yeah? How long will this go on? Depends, depends. What I mean, uh, at the moment I believe that uh, the direction which China is going in the development is the right one. Um, there definitely needs to be questioned if the speeds of every single development is the right one, but overall I believe it's, it, it will go on for quite some time. You also have a private life, not a lot of private life in China because you have to work a lot because of the speed? Well, I mean, in China when you, when you try to, to, to do something in, on, on, so to say, in, in, in the spare time, uh, you typically have to know exactly what you want to do and you go there and do it. 
Uh, in Germany, what I like personally very much, also in, in larger cities, for example, you can str uh, stroll along uh, uh, the, the streets and, and go there and there, and you don't have to do everything with a car. You know, that's one thing which I I believe that the German culture and way of living is 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 for me a bit more attractive. Uh, it might also come in China sooner or later, but at the moment it's really much, very much focused on you you go at a particular place and do your thing there. And it works. And it works, of course it works. And then you go to another one. Uh, and there's a lot of car driving involved. Here. Hmm. And you don't like to drive cars? I like to drive cars, but, in your but I also enjoy some relaxing time and just strolling along. You must have missed your, your Beatles cars, because they were only here for two, three days. Yeah. And then they had to go back. Uh, what is this feeling when you drive a Beetle car in Germany and you are at this relaxing pace? What, what happens to you then? Why are you doing it? Well, first of all, I'm really excited about the shape of the Beetle uh, car itself. Uh, and I also uh, I like actually the fact that this car is, has exactly what a car needs. Not more, but definitely not less. Uh, and I can do a lot of things on my own on the car. Because it's the simplicity and the serviceability which... So driving is not so important? I, I, no, no, driving is also important because driving is actually also challenging on those cars. Although they are having less horsepower and less speed, but they have a more complex way of driving. For example, the gearbox is not synchronized. So if you want to change uh, from the third gear to the second gear, you have to do all kinds of things with your gas pedal and the, and the clutch to get it in without noise or too much noise. So therefore, there is a lot of things so which you It took you a while do. to do this, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why did you start to collect beetles? Uh, I asked myself many times. Of course, my first car was a Beetle in 1979 or 78. It was an old Beetle already? No. It was a Beetle at that time from 1966. Not so old. Uh, well, it was a, a student's a, car. A student's car. It was a 1000 D Mark, uh, it was roughly the budget, and it had two years TÜV. But the real reason, and then I had always Beetle cars. Even my marriage car was a Beetle, actually. But that's a different story. But the real reason I believe why I'm so much into these cars is that I had, as a child, at two or three years old, I had a, a plate, a, a soup plate, which actually had a picture of a Beetle at the bottom. And my mother always that's said, okay, eat up, eat up, until you see the Beetle. And probably that <laughs> was finally making it. <laughs> Amazing. So at this time you didn't think about the speed or the pace or it was just a, a goal to get your food finished. Yeah. <laughs> you actually studied in America. Um, this is about uh, more than 25 years ago, uh, even more than 30 years ago. If you would be a student today, would China be the place to go? I would say it depends. Uh, uh, I studied physics uh, and for physics I still believe that uh, uh, the institutions in the United States are probably uh, the places uh, to, to, to go still. And nevertheless, I would definitely think more about it. It would not be such a no-brainer than it was at that point in time. Um, it was an interesting experience for me at that point in time also because uh, there I found out that there is another speed also possible, for example, in publishing results of your own academic work. Uh, and so I learned a lot about this aspect, which helped me on my later career as well. But you went back to Germany. Why didn't you stay in America? Uh, actually, I was there for almost a year for doing my, my, my uh, diploma thesis and later on again for, for my PhD thesis to a certain, uh, for a certain time. But I actually never planned to stay permanently there. Uh, I wanted to get from academia into real business and then I found a job uh, with Siemens actually in the area of medical equipment, which I liked a lot because it was attractive, it was doing good things for people. Today, you can say that uh, China is probably faster than America? Well, it's difficult to compare those two, two, two 
big, large countries. Uh, certainly, China has a development speed which is, at the moment, also looking at the GDP growth, uh, uh, much bigger than, than, than the United States. Uh, I think there are pockets and niches where, where both countries have their strengths and their weaknesses. Uh, but it's, uh, I admire China for, for, the, for the continuity of the growth over the last uh, years. And I think this opening up policy uh, started 30 years ago was just, just the right thing to do. What was the reason for it? It was not only luck. No, I think the, the, the fact that a, a society which was very much enclosed opens up can only go forward. Because, I mean, let's face it, no country can live alone in this world. The world is global. Uh, you want to be, you have product, you want to have products which come from outside. You want to sell your products to the outside. Therefore, I think the opening up was just the right thing to do. And there were some wise decisions on the way. Uh, for example, the development zones to, to create real state supported development zones like Shanghai or Shenzhen. Um, uh, and I think that was, that made it finally. You made this long trip between Erlangen in Germany and Beijing. What's your next idea? I don't have another trip uh, planned. Uh, uh, I, I have to say that this, is, this was a once in a lifetime thing because I'm living here in Beijing. I come from Erlangen, Germany. I like old cars. I like old Beatles. So it was just, it just fitted. Uh, we'll see. But some people say I'm crazy enough to have other ideas. It looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for being You're welcome. here. And uh, thanks for listening. And um, don't forget, um, as the Chinese are saying, Manzo, walk slowly. Thanks. Thanks.